and welcome to How to Web Live Focus Edition, the story of FinTech OS, powered by Microsoft Romania. In this episode, we'll take you into a journey behind the scenes of FinTech OS, one of the fastest growing European FinTech companies who last year has attracted a 14 million investment round led by Early Bird Ventures. Today's guests are co-founder Sergio Neguz and one of the first people to believe in the team, investor Dan Lupu, partner at Early Bird. The discussion will be moderated by Andrew McDowell. You maybe have read his articles in Financial Times, The Guardian or Politico. Big thanks to Microsoft Romania for powering this episode and helping startups like Fintech OS grow through programs like Microsoft for Startups. So, are you ready for some proven insights on how to grow a startup or attract investors? Sergio, Dan, Andrew, you're on. Delighted to be here today uh, to talk to Sergio Nyagut, the uh, co-founder of uh, Fintech OS, and Dan Lupu, partner at uh, Early Bird Venture Capital. My name's Andrew McDowell. I'm an independent consultant and journalist focusing on emerging markets, particularly Central Eastern Europe. I've written for the Financial Times, The Guardian, Politico, Business New Europe uh, over the past 15 years or so about um, emerging markets, including Romania and its exciting tech scene. So I'm really glad to be to be here and talking to, to two people who are really at the heart uh, of this very dynamic sector. To start off with, I'd, I'd like to ask you both a little bit about the, the background of the company. Uh, we had an informal discussion in the past and uh, Sergio, you talked a little uh, about uh, your vision and that of your, your business partner, Theodore. Could you tell me a little bit about that original seed of, of the idea that led to FinTech OS? Well, I've, I've, I've known Theo, my uh, co-founder, and, uh, you know, truly the, the brain and the muscle behind the, the, the idea. I've been, we've been a partners for like seven years now in his previous company, um, which was a normal software outsourcing firm that grew to maybe you know, 150, 200 people, 10 million in revenue and so on. And by that time, uh, it was very clear for us because we were doing services for banks and insurance companies. It was very clear that if we wanted them to accelerate even further compared to where they were, uh, the only way forward would have been to provide the technology that would allow them to do everything that they did in terms of digital transformation much faster. And Hence, the idea was there. And the uh, attempt, if you want to think of some accelerators and stuff, but then in the services company, you always look at the customer as the priority. So you're uh, taking away the resources from whatever incipient product you have all the time. So I think about a bit more than three years ago, um, there was one day a discussion uh, we were looking at, you know, what other companies are doing in terms of product development. And we said, look, if we want to do this professionally, and if we want to scale this as fast as possible for as many clients as possible, uh, providing better services to as many customers, final customers as possible, then we should productize it. And we should make a different company. We should literally abandon the old company in favor of a new one um, where, you know, this would be our only focus, creating the technology. Um, and, uh, well, it wasn't a very long discussion. I mean, he came with the idea and convinced me in like 10 seconds and the rest was about, you know, dreaming of what would be there. And we are not far from what we thought would be. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and can you tell me a little bit uh, about uh, the involvement with uh, Microsoft Startup Accelerator? Because uh, you're the first Romanian company accepted into it, which is, is uh, quite a feat. Um, you know, Romania has this great startup scene, but, but you were the first ones there. How has that relationship developed? It's, it's very interesting uh, because I, 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 in, in many ways, Microsoft came above our expectations in so many different ways. Uh, we, we were experienced uh, before with uh, implementation of CRM solutions based on Microsoft te technology. So we, we basically knew some people and we realized that if we were to accelerate uh, technology, uh, a, most, a very important resource would be development in the cloud and whatever uh, Azure as a platform is offering for our clients. What we have not realized is that the moment we really had our first release, serious release of the product, and it really allowed final clients to uh, 
take out some of the processes that they traditionally kept in their core systems into an automation layer that lied in the cloud and took advantage of Azure, uh, Microsoft fully embraced this. And not only embraced the idea, but embraced us as a technology, included us in their um, global uh, FinTech accelerator and uh, made us, if you want, in contact, put us in contact with uh, a number of potential clients. And they stu still do that today because I, it's mutual interest. Um, and although we are really, really small and Microsoft is really, really big, uh, we see that uh, cooperation working to our advantage and to their advantage at all instances. Excellent, thank you. Dan, could you tell me a little bit, uh, as an investor, how important was the involvement of, of Microsoft Startup Accelerator with FinTech OS in, in your view in, in building it into the sort of company that you really wanted to get behind? So uh, the, the thing about uh, the Microsoft Accelerator was uh, uh, if you want an early validation about uh, the product itself, that uh, there is a product which is important for us. Uh, but it was also uh, mm, an indirect validation because we could uh, think of uh, reaching out to their VC uh, arm as a potential co-investor. And uh, definitely with this kind of large organizations, there is a multifaceted uh, way in which you can, uh, you can work together uh, if you align and uh, if you can uh, take advantage of their various capabilities. Thank you both. How do you, may I ask you both in turn, how you see that relationship um, developing with Microsoft? I mean, over the uh, short, medium term. Um, Dan, how do you see that uh, evolving for FinTech OS um, now as, as someone who's, who's uh, investing behind the company? I mean, uh, if the company is able to, uh, to maintain, uh, to maintain uh, their relationship and uh, keep the interest of uh, of the people in Microsoft uh, alive. Uh, and there's definitely a great opportunity for distribution and the uh, client introductions. Uh, maybe medium term, uh, the company raises uh, other, uh, other rounds of capital, grows, becomes a more relevant company globally. Uh, maybe we can uh, think about uh, attracting uh, their investment arm as a shareholder in the company. Uh, so there's many different ways in which we can, uh, we can uh, do that. Uh, technically, there's also a, a case to be made uh, for their cloud uh, for their cloud service uh, to to become relevant uh, within the context of additional deployments that uh, fintech OS is uh, is making, uh, especially given uh, the fact that uh, large financial institutions are fairly particular about uh, the technology partners they are working with, uh, uh, especially around uh, security. Thank you. Sergio, what, what's your view? Um, is there anything you'd like to add? Is there anything specific that you're, you're working with Microsoft on that, that you can reveal or anything broadly about that relationship and how it's evolving? Look, I think, I think it's, um, it's, it's coming with positive surprises every time. We, frankly, we landed our first client in Asia uh, through the partnership with uh, Microsoft because they were there and some of uh, the guys that we've met before in Europe were there to actually preach our technology to the, to the final client. And otherwise, you know, having the, without having the endorsement of a giant such as Microsoft, it would be very difficult for us, you know, one continent away during a pandemic to really be able to have some sort of commercial traction with a bank on the other side of the globe. So, I think from that point of view, this is something that uh, will obviously grow because you see the, the thing when you create a, a good technology, a technology that clients would adopt, that they would want to use to develop you know, their digital assets inside their companies is it's important to get to someone with the right introduction. And the more we grow, the better the technology is, the more known it is, and more such introductions will be made. And the more such introductions are being made, it's more that banks and insurance companies are shifting their processes and products from being managed on-prem into being managed in the cloud, being managed in Asia, and increasing Asia consumption for Microsoft benefit as well. So I think it's a, it's a very nice partnership. I'm looking forward to see how it, it evolves, but I can only see it evolving um, 
astonishingly good. Excellent. And that's really interesting about the international expansion. Um, and it sort of draws out something that um, maybe a bit earlier on I'm, I'm interested to hear, which is I mean, you, you managed to get a managed portfolio of, of 5 billion euros within 12 months of being established. And some really big um, European clients like Airster, Vienna Insurance Group, TBI Bank, IDEA Bank. Uh, how how did you manage that sort of initial explosive expansion? What's the what's the secret there? Well, I think at the end of the day, if you're if you if you're in the kind of techno technology that ends up being acquired by um, big clients, you end up working with large amounts of money because this is what the financial institutions are about. They are about you know handling. Uh, big chunks of money and this this is where we are and this is where we provide more value but this doesn't mean very interestingly that it's there necessarily that we have our most complex and most um, impactful um, solutions being built sometimes you have mid-sized banks and mid-sized uh, insurance uh, companies that are acquiring very complex end-to-end -end solutions that are building perhaps a bank from scratch or they are, they are, they are bu building very thorough engagement layers and automation layers to interface with very complex pre-existing systems and with very innovative fintech players that are coming into the market. And it's the, the, the whole benefit, if you want, is into building that complexity and facilitating that amazing final customer experience, much more than you know, the sheer uh, numbers of you know how much is being transacted or what is the value of the portfolio of the clients that we facilitate interacting with their um, with, with, with the, um, our, um, our clients. I think that emphasis on, on service to, to the end customer is something crucial and something that, that you're you're bringing up. Um, I mean, is there something about the culture of the company specifically about that, that delivery or an understanding that you think your team has particularly that allows you to have that um, extra bit of delivery or is it the way you work with clients? Well, I think it's, it's about understanding that if you're into the B2B as we are, and that this is, this is you know, typical enterprise SaaS, B2B, it's very standard, but you can only be as successful as your clients are successful with their final customers. And if we do not manage to bring the experience provided by our clients to their customers at the level of the experience that is being provided more and more by FinTech challengers in the market, then it will not have any commercial success and it will not justify in turn their investment in us. So our only way forward you know, if you want hand in hand uh, between um, us as a technology platform, uh, our clients as financial institutions and our partners, various fintech solutions is to go together ahead. And this actually creates broader, um, easier to consume, um, easier to access, uh, more complex um, financial services for everyone at every, any given moment, omni-channel, on the preferred channel, at the right time, in the right shape. Thank you. There's a few things I'd like to, to draw out maybe a bit later in the conversation, particularly as we talk about the company's evolution. But I'd like to bring in Dan here, sort of looking chronologically. Uh, Dan, your involvement in FinTech OS, um, how, how did that develop and how has it uh, evolved? W what role are you playing? Um, obviously, VC is often uh, pretty active in, in the way companies develop. Could you tell us a little bit ab about how things work? And then we'll hear Sergio's point of view afterwards. Uh, I actually knew Sergio from the, from the tech scene for, for a number of years. Uh, and then uh, when he joined the FinTech OS, uh, basically, we, uh, he reached out. We had, a, we had a chat about what they wanted to do. Uh, which was uh, intriguing to me. Uh, the thing about uh, service companies transitioning into product companies uh, is not a trivial uh, thing. Uh, I was expecting this to happen uh, more often uh, in the region because uh, there's a large number of uh, service uh, companies that uh, tried and failed to do this. 
I was expecting many more to to complete the transition, but it didn't happen. So uh, one uh, company that was making the transition uh, interested me quite uh, quite a lot. The space interested me quite a lot. Uh, the idea of uh, digitizing uh, business processes, digitizing interactions with uh, with cli uh, with uh, clients, and uh, uh, automating uh, automating uh, interactions and business processes was something that I was somehow familiar with uh, and uh, understood that uh, it's, uh, it's going to become uh, even more important uh, in, the, in the financial uh, services space. So we had a conversation. Uh, I think I gave them uh, my opinion, which was that uh, they were too early for us. Uh, but uh, then a couple of months uh, later, uh, as the product evolved, their traction with clients uh, got better, and uh, our fund, our second fund uh, for the region, the Digitalist Fund uh, 2, uh, became operational. Uh, we decided to, uh, to basically uh, make the first investment with the, uh, with the, in FinTech OS, and uh, from there, that's, uh, that's how we got engaged. And um, beyond that, sort of interesting point you make about about the the service to product um shift and the fact that not too many companies from the region have done it what else stood out and stands out uh for in fintech os for you as an investor and someone who knows the tech scene you, uh, very well the um, the automation team the digitizing of uh, of uh, processes and the client in, uh, interactions and the focus on a specific vertical, which is large enough because uh, remember these days, everybody talks about fintechs, which are mainly the uh, technology enabled new financial institutions that are being created. But uh, that's, uh, those are a tiny drop uh, in the very large uh, traditional financial sector comprising uh, banks and insurance companies. And uh, uh, this, uh, these players are, uh, are where the market is, are where the money is being handled, the big volumes, the profits are there. Um, so this focus was uh, something uh, that led me to believe that uh, they can build up a large enough company that uh, would, uh, would make it worthwhile for, for our fund to invest in. Thank you. Sergio, could you tell me a little bit from your point of view, that relationship uh, with Dan, obviously, and, and those initial words, maybe you're a bit small for us. I mean, what, what impact did that have? And it, it must have been useful to have an informal conversation with someone you trusted and knew at that stage. And obviously, it's now developed. To, to be frank, there is a saying in the um, uh, investment space. And uh, in this investment space, it's actually... Um, uh, they say that uh, you go and ask for money and you get advice. You go and ask for advice and you end up getting money. I didn't know the saying when I approached Dan. Uh, it was just that we were at the beginning. We knew that we wanted to do something with uh, uh, investment and VC funds and attract uh, the necessary fuel to speed up our, our growth process. After all, we gave up on a, on a traditional company for that. So we, we wanted to, to see how, how to actually do it. And he was, if you want, in our network, uh, the closest, very successful one. Because at the time, uh, UiPath was growing and uh, it was part of their portfolio. And uh, we wanted to understand what were they doing so special? How did they start at the very beginning? How can we do and learn something from that? And aside from that, you know, uh, thing, because, you know, after all, these different companies, we wanted to discuss with Dan because he had seen a lot of different companies and probably hundreds of companies are pitching to him every year. Uh, and this is only the ones that get to pitch to him, not the ones that would, would, would reach out to him. So at the end of the day, we wanted some advice. Are we on the right track? Is this what we should be doing at this stage? Is this the right focus? How good is a good product for this stage? What do investors want to see for a seed, for a series A? What are we looking for at, at, at that particular stage? And there was quite a lot of learning. And we used, frankly, that learning to go and pitch to other investors as well, because it was, you know, um, what, what was there. 
but we did it from the beginning with the understanding that, yeah, you know, uh, it would be great if uh, Dan himself would become interested in, at some point and uh, would, uh, you know, uh, convince his partners with Early Bird and um, uh, to, to invest would be the right time because they would have the right fund. And by the time, but, but in the meantime, they have also raised a new fund that was focusing on Central Eastern Europe, the fund that they eventually invested from. And uh, the discussion at some point became a lot more concrete and more about, you know, yeah, let's make that assumption. Let's see how would that work if you were to invest uh, as opposed to, you know, just getting advice on how to get other investors. And of course, we were happy to, to get that, uh, that kind of um, um, advice on a permanent basis as, uh, in the board. And uh, we, are, we are still taking advantage of it. Sounds like an excellent strategic fit that, that you have together. Um, and sort of, I'm interested in, in how the relationship has developed in, from the informal, as I've said, to that sort of investment and, and uh, being on the board and, and part of the We still story. keep it informal. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good. But may I ask you informally what the, where, where the relationship goes from here, Dan? Well, I mean, it all depends on uh, their ability to execute. Uh, we will still uh, maintain a personal relationship, but uh, professionally, uh, they, they need to grow and they need to outgrow uh, both me and uh, my fund. Uh, fund uh, find uh, better investors, larger investors, smarter investors that will help them That's even quite more. That's the challenge, if I may. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, if you, as they grow, uh, they will find the different challenges that we, I mean, we did not uh, witness before or that uh, they might get uh, better advice uh, from, uh, from other people. Thank you. Although my honest, my honest straight answer to your where does this go would be from time to time to, to appear on a terrace yeah. together <laughs> with some very nice casual conversation and some very interesting business conversation as well. That sounds idyllic. There are a few better things than, than a Bucharest terrace and nice weather. Uh, maybe I'll join you for an informal half at some stage. Yeah. Um, so, to you, you, I, I understand that obviously you'll be looking for the next round of financing. Is is there much that you can reveal on on that side? I, th I think it's obvious. When when you're in our shoes, it's always that you're you know uh, having two sources of finance. One source is indeed money from the clients, from the paying clients, but the other source, which is at least equally important, is money from the investment funds, which you can't get if you don't get the first ones in the first place. So um, yeah, if, if you are, we're looking at the fact that we raised a quite impressive Series A at uh, the end of uh, 2019, then probably the beginning of 2021 is the right time for a Series B. And if we are to do that, uh, at the beginning of 2021, then probably pretty soon we are there to raise, uh, to, to initiate the, the process. And we are looking indeed to a 30, 40 million dollars Series B to take us to where this uh, global company, FinTech OS, temporarily not so global, uh, needs to be. So we have to invest more in the technology to be more competitive to be more easy to use by a larger uh, a number of professionals and uh, developers uh, in the financial institutions. Uh, and at the same time, we have to invest in the go to market and be present in more markets. We are three years old. We have touched a number of markets in Europe. We have barely and acci almost accidentally landed a couple of uh, clients in um, uh, North America and in Southeast Asia. But we should build the infrastructure to be there, to be a local player in um, North America, in Southeast Asia, in other places of the globe. And this requires investment much more than what we are currently uh, getting from uh, our customers. Are there any specific markets that you're, you're looking at or that you're particularly um, looking to, to enter at the moment? I mean, bearing in mind the, the global financial situation, are there any interesting developments geographically you could tell us a little about? I, I think it's think pretty much if I, if I can pick up on, on this one, uh, mm, part, of the, part of the reason we thought this is a, 
this is a company that can grow to a significant size, was the global nature of the opportunity. Uh, look at the additional financial institutions uh, all over the world. They are facing pretty much the same issues. And uh, those were only exacerbated by the, by the, by the crisis. Uh, so everybody is now rushing to digitize their interactions with clients and automate their internal, uh, internal uh, uh, business processes. Yeah, this is a global opportunity. It's uh, these are global, uh, global. Uh, glo uh, this is a global industry, global opportunity. So basically, the, we need to we need to be rational about how we approach uh, this uh, this go-to-market uh, development, uh, depending on the on the size of the funding that the company has available to. Excellent. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Sergio? Yeah, that you know, uh, you you can't get from. Uh, uh, local to global in one step uh, and global has many many points where you need to to go we have not made a full decision as to which is exactly the sequence of geographies that we need to approach for our geographic expansion but it's pretty clear that you have very very large markets out there that have thousands of players in the financial industry that all need to fully transform their businesses in a way that is very digestible and very customer friendly for their pool of customers. And obviously, uh, if we are looking at the States, if we are looking at Southeast Asia, if we're looking at Germany and the Dutch countries, this is, these are places that we have not touched at all or barely touched for the time being. And this is where clearly opportunities are. And we can't take all the opportunities at, at one stage and we can't really you know be sure that by the end of 2021 we're going to be in all these places but we are going to definitely invest in in, uh, in doing what needs to be done in order to provide this technology which is in fact a competitive advantage to as many players as possible in as many markets as possible excellent thank you just briefly i mean what what challenge what are the particular challenges that that sort of expansion will will create beyond the obviously needing capital to expand um you're an entrepreneur you relish challenges but what, what are the what are the things that you see is it human resources is it um regulatory barriers what what are the challenges for for a global fintech company like your own i think it's you know if you, if you want to grow very fast it's always a, a sort of experience as, as, as you would try to drink some water from a water hose or something like that, you know? Eventually, uh, there will be a lot of spillover and there will be some things that will, will hurt and things that you will not do entirely right from the first instance. But eventually, if you're, if you're doing it, you know, in the right direction, with the right diligence of allocating resources and with the right speed, it would work if the technology is good enough, which is, in our case is, so um, where I expect the challenges to be, I expect that you know, uh, we will hire a lot of people at some times and we will not have everybody you know, extremely well-trained on our technology before they will be uh, reaching the market. We will have um, people that we would have hired wrongly, not the right ones, and we will have to part with them and um, because this is how, how it's done, we will be having to adapt to different regulations and different markets and different, if you want, business scene. But this is where, if you want, funny enough, I'm, I'm less worried about. I'm worried only about their preconceptions sometimes, as do you have enough references in our home market? But I'm not worried Truly, because every time when we uh, cross a border and um, we've crossed the number of borders in Europe, we have more than 15 markets where our technology is being deployed right now. So every time when we are crossing a border, we face the same challenges. And every time we're solving it with the knowledge of the regulatory system from the clients and from our implementation partners, the system integrators. We are working with a big integrators of the world with uh, Deloitte, with EY, with Capgemini, with big firms. We are also look, look, working with small firms that have been there working together with this bank or that insurance company for uh, years or for tens of years. So we rely upon their competence 
to learn the things that we don't know as of yet. And we hire professional expertise when that professional expertise is needed. We're not trying to sell, if you want, banking as a service or insurance as a service. We do not substitute the business purpose of our clients. We are just providing them the technology for them to build with our knowledge, with their knowledge, with the integrator's knowledge, with the partner's knowledge, with Microsoft's knowledge, when, when that is the case, to build the best in class um, digital experiences for their customers and their other categories of users. Excellent, thank you. I, I think that's, that's very interesting. Um, as you say, you're working, as you, you've both drawn out, working with, with financial sector incumbents who need to become more nimble, they need to be more online, they need to communicate better with their customers in all sorts of ways, rather than sort of the, we discussed the sort of broad pool of, of, of uh, specific fintech, you're really helping uh, banks and financial institutions across the world meet uh, these new challenges. Um, before we move on, I'd, I'd like to bring that to Dan. Are there any particular uh, examples from FinTech OS, from case studies with all these major international institutions uh, that the company works with, that, that Sergio's mentioned, we've talked about Esther Group, we've talked about Vienna Insurance. Are there any particular ones that you as an investor and someone involved in the company has thought, that is a particularly strong selling point. That's, uh, that's how we can really go global with this. Um, yeah, we always uh, uh, try to understand how people, how clients, actual clients are working with a specific product. Uh, one thing that I learned a long time ago is that uh, the market is always right. And uh, my uh, good opinion or bad opinion on something doesn't really matter. Uh, I've seen incredible, uh, I, I've seen ideas that I thought uh, are incredible and an obvious, uh, an obvious match to the market that never took off. Uh, so I spoke with as many clients that the company had as possible. And uh, I was particularly impressed uh, with the conversation I had with the uh, NN group, NN being a large uh, European based insurance group. Uh, that uh, that was uh, outlining the case for making uh, for making fintech OS uh, the reference architecture for their uh, various subsidiaries, and uh, I would say this is uh, what I call in the case of fintech OS the reverse capil uh, capillarity uh, distribution model where companies in Eastern Europe uh, become proficient at their client and uh, initially they engage with the local uh, subsidiary, but from that local subsidiary, they get bumped up to the headquarter and from the headquarter, they get uh, then pushed down to other subsidiaries uh, uh, within the group. Uh, and I think this is a fairly powerful uh, distribution model and uh, that's a go-to market advantage that is difficult to, to, to replicate. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, just, just to add on that, I think it's, uh, you know, every, everybody is looking at these uh, anchor clients, the big names that have virtually unlimited budgets to invest in their digital infrastructure. And sometimes we get to, you, to, to the situation on where, you know, yeah, but this has been done before. And look, this particular large bank in the States or large bank in the UK, has done it for years. Yeah, it's true. They may have done it for years, but they have invested tens of millions to have it done. And the market is full of hundreds and thousands of players who don't have those tens of millions in their budget. And they are trying desperately to get to build as fast as possible matching customer experience for their customers, which they worked hard to get in the first place and for the new customers that they want to get from the market. So this is an amazing opportunity as well. The mid-sized players, the second tier, the third tier players that need to do digital transformation, they are perhaps one step behind the market leaders and they don't have the resources to put in. And this is where we come, where, where we come in. And we solve problems that you know, we, 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 the technology being so versatile and being so easy to use by the, um, developers and the, the business analysts, they are actually able to build the missing pieces in their 
current digital infrastructure as they perceive it in the order that they perceive it. And then once they have done a few of these missing pieces, they see the opportunities to interconnect those by adding more pieces, more journeys in a digital engagement layer and adding more automation among those products. And since Dan brought the example of an and this is actually what happened with them as they are actually expanding further down towards the core, the uh, use cases that are handled with FinTech OS. And they are expanding in all their business units, the use of FinTech OS as uh, the, uh, the, the basis techn base, base technology upon which they are building uh, the digital journeys. And they propel that not only to different markets, but they propel it to different uh, business uh, lines uh, as well. So in the end, it does become the infrastructure of the firm. Thank you. This is, uh, this is what I this is uh, what I call. I always create my my own uh, mental models about how to talk uh, about companies I invest uh, in, and uh, I try to to use these mental models to create stories around them. So with uh, in the case of fintech OS, I use this uh, reverse capillarity distribution model and uh, in terms of uh, product approach and the uh, sales approach I use the reverse salami tactic. Uh, it's quite powerful to approach uh, 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 core, uh, core strategic issue like uh, digitizing processes and digitizing uh, interactions with customers uh, in, in a very discreet way uh, that gives the customer the ability to make uh, uh, discrete decisions instead of uh, making big transformational uh, uh, projects, uh, they have to take only small decisions like uh, digitize the onboarding uh, of a, for a particular product. Uh, because these are uh, easy to decide, uh, do not cost a lot of money, are not disruptive to the existing infrastructure. In fact, they integrate well with the, uh, with the existing infrastructure. Uh, and once, uh, once delivered, uh, you have a basis from which to start and continue to add slices. And uh, once you add enough slices, all of a sudden you realize that you have the full salami. So that's why I call it the, the reverse salami tactic. I very much like that and will make a note to, to use it in future. Um, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, we, we've, we've covered quite a lot of, of uh, your bullishness about the future. We, we've covered future plans quite well, I think. Uh, one thing that uh, I don't think we've mentioned the word COVID once in about 35 minutes. So I'm interested on what, uh, is that a dry we cough, about the crisis. <laughs> we did. We, we, we... <laughs> we did we did talk about the crisis, right? True, yeah. true. Um, I'm wondering what the challenges have been of, of getting through this difficult period uh, and whether it's had an impact on business at all. I mean, my, my conclusions from, from your bullishness is, is that really, you know, this sector is going places, you know, you're, you're going as international as possible. But have there been, been challenges, whether they're operational or, or financial? Look, I think, I think whoever says that look, we, we have not been affected by the COVID uh, situation is either because they're providing uh, something to treat the COVID, whether it's uh, video conferencing or medication, I don't know, or uh, they are delusional. I think, you know, the, 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 the world has been changing and the world has been changing, changing suddenly uh, in a disruptive way, in, um, in a way that we have not anticipated. So I remember that b back in February and March, we were sweating, thinking of where will this take us? You know, will we have enough um, business from our customers or will they be so affected that they would have to cancel? Will we have enough support from our investors or will they you know, fear that this is no longer going to uh, you know, work, be financeable and they will just back away? So we had our times of anxiousness and our plans B and C and looked for rationalizing the business and looked for what would be our best way out of it if the situation was worse, if the economies would have collapsed, if the pandemic as such would have proven to be a much stronger threat to 
uh, the, the, the public health and the, this way of living. Now, maybe we were a bit lucky because it wasn't that bad and because the, the government interventions and the central bank's interventions were strong enough to uh, keep as much as possible of the business infrastructure there. Um, but what happened in reality is that many of the clients have accelerated their uh, digitalization processes because uh, social distance you know, comes with the side effect that you can't go to the branch of the insurer or of the, of, of the, of the bank. And you can't do, go to the branch even though uh, you're, you're perhaps a senior citizen that has always used the branch and now has just to use the phone and internet to connect and access services. So this created a pressure on the financial sector to reform and to bring digitalization forward. And this came very aggressively, but at the same time, a big part of the financial sector continues to be cautious on allocating investments for the coming months because they are not sure yet what will happen and how things will evolve over the next um, months. So there are different trends, some of them that are pushing, if you want our business forward, some of them that are actually creating a level of cautiousness on, on, on us. But overall, as I said before, I think it's, if you have a strong enough technology and if there are very strong reasons for the clients to use it and deploy it for the benefits of their final customers, and they are able to monetize the investment in our technology fast enough. Now, this actually places us in a competitive scenario that is favorable to the growth of the company, even though the overall economic environment is less favorable. Thank you. Dan, what's your feeling? Uh, are, you, are you among the, the, on the cautious side or, or the less cautious side as an investor? We, we, let's say that we like to think of ourselves as uh, disciplined uh, investors. Uh, and uh, this means that we need to be aware of the risks. Uh, and the risks are coming in various flavors with uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, investment focus, uh, both in terms of uh, technology and, uh, and region. Uh, the region clearly lacks uh, uh, enough capital for follow-on investments. So any, any kind of volatility in the, in the global markets uh, gets immediately reflected uh, here. Uh, that's why as a strategy, we uh, like to create uh, consortiums of uh, investors that uh, invest together with us. All my investments in the region were done together with co-investors. Um, and uh, what uh, concerns me are, uh, I mean, it concerns me the fact that uh, capital that is uh, nominally interested in, uh, in making investments here uh, is pretty fickle. Uh, they come and go. If uh, things become volatile, I'm uh, I'm uh, concerned that uh, they will be uh, they will be gone when the company needs uh, cash. Uh, luckily, we keep a lot of uh, cash in reserves, so we can continue to invest in the companies that uh, that are performing well. Mm, definitely, uh, the level of uncertainty is uh, is creating uh, potentially uh, additional volatility in the markets. If you look at uh, the, global, uh, the global macro environment where uh, interest rates are zero or negative, uh, pushing uh, public market uh, equities uh, to fairly high levels and uh, quite unexpected valuations, uh, this does create an incentive for both uh, uh, larger players to step in earlier uh, but also uh, creates an uh, opportunity for companies to, uh, to raise larger uh, amounts of money. And uh, this is great, but uh, volatility has the downside of uh, moving quickly on the other side. And uh, this spooks investors, which are trying to retreat uh, uh, from, uh, from the fringes of their geographic income. So it's, uh, I mean, we need, to, we need to be aware of it. The, uh, obviously, neither us nor the company nor their clients can fight it. Uh, but we need to be to keep nimble, uh, be prepared, uh, keep uh, reserves, 
and uh, be quick about uh, decision making. If I may add something, you know, the, the good thing about getting investments uh, from uh, uh, people like Dan and uh, funds like uh, uh, Early Bird is the fact that we were able to consult. So we had access to this kind of uh, reasoning in board meetings that were at, 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 at the heat uh, of the, uh, at the peak of the, of, of the crisis were not, not more than uh, 10 days, two weeks apart, one meeting from, from the next, to reassess the situation, to understand where we are, to understand what are the options, what is happening in the world, what is happening with us, what is happening with the investment, what is happening with customers, and how we should better react. And I think this is, uh, this is you know, playing it rational and being prepared for the worst while uh, shooting for the best. I think uh, is uh, what kept us going and uh, you know, gave us uh, uh, the possibility to continue an aggressive growth during uh, complicated times. Excellent, thank you both. Dan touched on, on the, the uh, rather shallow capital markets that exist when you get to a certain stage in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, Obviously, we're talking about a global company here and one that's expanding internationally, but is there anything that you'd uh, particularly like to draw out for the viewers about the strength of, of the region in tech and particularly fintech and maybe particularly with, with Romania? Um, I've written quite a lot about companies that, that talk about Romanian DNA, even if they're based in Silicon Valley. Is that something you, you identify with? And um, what, what's, what's the future for um, this uh, very interesting sector in the region? Well, uh, th there are two aspects here. One is we want to be a global company and being a global company comes with uh, paying a price that you have to you know, focus on markets that are far more developed than Eastern Europe. So you have to understand those markets deeply and whatever solutions you're providing and whatever experiences you're providing can no longer be at the level that may be enough for Eastern Europe, but may not be enough for the big financial centers of the world. So for us, uh, we have to move on and we have to create a very strong footprint in the markets and the, the developed markets where if you want, the trends are being made where the trends in the digitalization are being created because we are competitive in those markets. So we should be able to be, to, to, to be there. Now, that being said, uh, we have also been, I think, quite lucky uh, that uh, having started a business, a technology business in Eastern Europe, in Romania, uh, we were able to take advantage of, I would say a number of trends. The first trend, there's a very strong technology educated pool of talent in the region and in particular in Romania. We were able to get on board a large number of um, engineers, of developers, um, of analysts that have had the right experiences working some of them with uh, you know, regional centers regional outsourced centers of large multinationals, some of them working with um, other companies in Western Europe that we, and we brought them initially back to um, uh, Romania. And we were able to take advantage of that talent in technology. At the same time, when it comes to developing the business, to developing world-class products, to developing, um, if you want, uh, delivery engagement op opportunities with, uh, with uh, larger clients. Obviously, we need a level of expertise that is simply not available in um, countries like Romania. So we have to seek for it. We have to um, find it in the UK, in the Netherlands, perhaps in the States in the future, in other places. And this is something that we always need to manage. But we are also lucky uh, with the fact that um, the timing was right. The availability of early stage venture capital to be invested in companies originated uh, from Romania have just you know, uh, grown tremendously over the last few years. The first two funds, or should I say two, two funds and a half, 
that are originated from, uh, from Romania and they're providing early stage um, VC investment. Uh, they are in the market. So, and with, with it, there is also a, a big increase in angel investment and a big increase in uh, done by angel investment groups that are syndicating uh, together. And this facilitated the transformation, if you want, of a number of technology professionals into early stage entrepreneurs. So the entire stage of early stage businesses that are now being born in um, Romania is of a different complexity and of a larger number compared to what was there like five years ago. So this is, I think, a, a very strong trend that we are just a part of, perhaps one of the first ones, but I'm pretty sure there will be more companies, you know, being born today or having been born a year ago that we are gonna see in, a, in, in the next years in the international markets. Thanks, Sergi. Dan, you, you back some of the, the biggest um, upstarts in coming out of the region. Um, what do you see as the evolution of the ecosystem and how has there been that, that growth in, in early stage financing over the past few years? What's been behind that? It must have been exciting to be, to be one of the leading participants in it. This is a huge region, both uh, uh, geographically, population wise and, uh, and uh, GDP. Uh, so you are talking everything east of Austria and Germany, all the way to Belarus, Ukraine, Turkey, uh, north to south, Poland to Greece. Uh, so mm, huge region, uh, uh, but uh, totally lacking uh, all kinds of uh, uh, venture capital uh, funds. Uh, I think now across the region, the early stage uh, seed and the very early stage uh, investment it's addressed to a certain uh, degree, actually to various degrees uh, in different countries, but uh, I think it's more or less uh, in place. Uh, and this clearly had an effect uh, drawing out uh, hundreds of new companies that are being created, uh, which is very, very encouraging. Still the level of company creation is, uh, is well below uh, what uh, more developed regions are, are recording. Uh, which for us, which are investing maybe at a bit later stage, uh, creates, a, uh, creates a wave like uh, uh, activity in which we see more interesting uh, investment opportunities in Romania one year, the next year it's in Slovakia, the next year in Poland, the next year in Turkey and so on. So uh, the, the, there is a flow, uh, there is not a constant tide, uh, if you want. And uh, it's also very broad. Uh, that's why we stay uh, with the, if you want to uh, quote, uh, with a generalist focus. Uh, there is no focus, basically. We take what the market throw at, uh, throws at us. Uh, we even go against uh, what we thought we will never do. So I did a hardware investment. I did a consumer investment from the region, uh, which were things that I, I thought I'm never going to do, uh, given our mostly B2B uh, software focus. But uh, this happened and you need to be flexible. Uh, I do expect that uh, as more capital uh, becomes uh, available and this will come on the back of uh, good performance from the existing funds and hopefully with, uh, but unfortunately with time, uh, more uh, institutional capital uh, dedicated to the region. Uh, things will improve and will stabilize. Uh, and that's why we, will, uh, we welcome more funds. Uh, might, seem, uh, might seem a bit odd because more, uh, more funds, uh, more capital uh, mean, uh, means more competition. But I think uh, it's healthy competition because it will drive the overall uh, growth of the market. Excellent. I share the I, I, I share the view. It's um, it's it's the early stage that started to work. It's the later stage that is completely inexistent for the uh, for, for the market. So uh, already when we reach now Series B, we can't look back at uh, at the region. We have to look only at the the, the larger financial centers as sources of capital investment. And this is a in a way a market inefficiency that needs to be corrected. Because obviously, and this is valid for the entire Eastern Europe, 
there has not been enough time to build enough private capital for investment and to build the institutions that will have the know-how on how to manage that, uh, that uh, uh, capital. So yes, we will probably see more um, public funding in the space, but even with all the public funding that I can imagine, I'm pretty sure that the, the lack of capital will continue to be there. The need for capital will continue to be there. And it will be very complementary to an otherwise well-developed lab labor uh, availability. Good quality, sophisticated labor that is available, that has the uh, intellectual power to build new things, but doesn't have the capital to turn it entirely into you know, fully grown global businesses. Any, thanks very much, gentlemen, for your time. Do you have a, a last uh, two or three sentence summary of, uh, of our discussion and, and the way ahead? I'll start with you, Dan. Uh, we live in, uh, in interesting times, which is uh, all we can hope for. Uh, we are uh, lucky to, uh, to be in the position of uh, investing now from a brand new fund uh, with enough uh, firepower uh, to uh, continue to invest throughout uh, throughout the the uh, ups and downs of the of the markets, uh, we are open for business. We are looking for uh, for successful entrepreneurs. We are ready to uh, to continue to back uh, our existing portfolio companies. So uh, I'm quite excited about uh, about what lies ahead. Thank you, Sergio. Well, I you know I'm. The, the more the time passes, the more, you know, we enter in discussion with new clients in new territories and so on, the more I believe that FinTech OS is here because it grabbed a very specific opportunity at a very specific moment in time. And this is going to grow big. It's going to grow big because luckily it's not only us, you know, doing our work the way we think, but we have the support, the financial support and the know-how support from our investors from uh, advisors, from everyone. And um, you know, this has been a very interesting conversation. It's always a pleasure to have a discussion with Dan, no offense, Andrew, but it's always a pleasure to have a discussion <laughs> with Dan because you always learn something new out of it. Of course, I would have preferred the discussion to be over a beer on a terrace, but I'm pretty sure we have that, those opportunities as well. But uh, for a facilitated discussion, I think uh, it, it was very good, and I thank you for that, Andrew, and I thank you for, for, for that, uh, um, Microsoft, through this uh, initiative with How to Web and uh, the possibility to share a little bit of our internal discussions and brainstorming and thinking ahead and analyzing and making decisions with a wider audience. Thank you very much. No offence taken, Sergio, at all. It's been a pleasure speaking to, to Dan Lupu and Sergio Nedut today. Uh, thank, you, and Andrew. thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That's it. Thanks for tuning in. For new episodes, keep an eye on our social media channels. So until next time, stay curious. <laughs>